Uh, during this, uh, the Sunday's past Easter, and it's, it's hard to believe that uh, this is now our, our eighth Sunday on a Zoom service. Um, I've been considering Bible stories about people who have had an encounter with the risen Christ. And last week I reminded us that it's notable that, that Jesus didn't appear to kings, to governors, or to religious rulers. He showed himself to his followers, to Mary in the garden, Cleophas and his wife on the road to Emmaus, the disciples in the upper room. And today uh, we are going to look at one of the stories of, of a disciple named Thomas. We often call him Doubting Thomas. And we, we've seen Thomas before in the gospel stories. If you read through the gospels, he, he has a bit of a reputation. Um, um, he, in the beginning, he was one who responded to Jesus' call. We, we don't know the, the details. Jesus said, follow me, and he, and he did. He was one of the 12. He was looking for the coming of the Messiah, and he believed Jesus was that person. They called him, as Scripture says, by his Greek name, Didymus, which means twin, instead of his Hebrew or Aramaic name, Thomas. And some say that they called him twin because he looked like Jesus. I don't know. In John chapter 11, Jesus had been avoiding going to Jerusalem because of death threats. He received word, though, that his friend Lazarus was ill, and he told his disciples that Lazarus had died. And Jesus tells in chapter 11, he tells his disciples, let us go to Jerusalem, let us go to see Lazarus. And he says these words, so that you may believe. And then the next verse, Thomas responds, always the pessimist or the skeptic. And Thomas says, let us go so that we may die with Jesus. Again, in chapter 14, we see Thomas with the, uh, the disciples in the upper room with Jesus. And he, and he told his disciples that he's leaving. He's going to prepare a place for them. He told them that they need to trust God. They need to believe in God. And Thomas responds, we don't know where you're going. How can we believe you? Thomas doesn't get it. And Jesus responds with those famous words. He tells Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Thomas perhaps represents the skeptic in many of us. He's the see it to believe it kind of a guy. He's, he's the try it before you buy it kind of a guy. We might call him the glass half empty person. There's a lot of those around, and I can be that way sometimes myself. In, in the face of this coronavirus, I, I've heard folks say, Let, let's make the most of this and figure out how we can continue to, be go to live out God's kingdom in this world. But I envision Thomas might say right now, let's just give up and stay at home until this is all over. Some might say uh, social distancing is working to flatten the curve. Thomas, I imagine, would say, see, it's not that bad. Social distancing isn't necessary. During the, during the Reformation, the theologian John Calvin said that the story of Thomas is in the Gospel of John to show that doubt is common to all of us. Honest doubt, it isn't a contradiction of faith, he said, Calvin says, but an essential quality in a healthy, growing relationship with God. Honest doubt will lead to understanding and confession. So let's look at this story of, uh, with, with, with Thomas after the resurrection. It, it, at the beginning, we, we see skepticism. Jesus appeared to the other disciples, but then Thomas shows up and he says, unless I see the nail scars in his hand and touch the scar in his eyes, I'm not going to believe. Now this skepticism, it, it, it's at two levels. First, he doesn't believe the facts. He doesn't believe that Jesus is alive. And secondly, it's hurt his relationship with his friends. He doesn't believe the word of his friends. Sometimes we have to show proof of things. I, I, I know everybody here of a certain age and over have had to show proof of ID at one time. You need a photo ID to, to do a lot in our, in our country. We, we, we need it to prove who we are. You need a photo ID to drive a car, to purchase a house, or to purchase a car. You need a, a, a photo ID to get a marriage license. You need a, a 
photo ID to travel at the airport, for example. Thomas was one that, that wanted an ID proof that this person who was appearing to the disciples was in fact Jesus. Now there's a lot of false information circulating uh, these days. Uh, there's a lot of false cor uh, coronavirus inf information on the internet, on the news, all over the place. Uh, you can, can check out and you can find that blowing a hot air dryer into your mouth will cure coronavirus. I'm skeptical. You can, you can learn that inhaling iodine will, will cure it. You can say that you will keep from getting coronavirus if you drink hot water every 15 minutes. I know what I would be doing in between every 15 minutes. You can, you can cure coronavirus by ingesting bleach. You can prevent it by having what they call the coronavirus diet. And a certain evangelist on TV was selling a cure, a, a silver solution of uh, colloidal silver, saying it was a cure for the coronavirus. You can go to snoops.com. It's formerly known as the Urban Legends reference page, and it tries to separate fact from fiction to see what, is this true or is this not? But I've also learned that many people are skeptical of Snopes. Now, I, I, I occasionally like to, to, to read uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not. Uh, sometimes there's articles on the internet or uh, the, there are books, and it's, it's possible Ripley's Believe It or Not because there's a lot of unbelievable stuff in this world. You can just check it out sometime. I, some of the more interesting ones to me recently that there was a guy named Paul Blair that he could swing 132 hula hoops on his body at the same time. He did this back in November 2009. I, I, it, I, it's hard to believe. I, I can't keep one hula hoop going. I think I'd have to see it to, to believe it. Um, back in 2008, the, the government of Chile issued a 50 peso coin and it had the name of the country misspelled and nobody noticed it for over a year when the coins were in circulation. Here, here's an interesting one I, I don't believe. Uh, a, a Colorado physicist, his name is Sterly Backus and his 11 year old son, Xander, they engineered and 3D printed a full size working Lamborghini. I, it's hard to believe. Here, here's a strange one. In, in 2014, a, a pair of underpants autographed by the mayor of Brussels was stolen from the Brussels Museum of Underpants. I don't want to see this to believe it. It's, it's hard to believe that a museum for, of underpants exists. Did you know that the world's largest hot dog was 669 feet long made in Paraguay in 2011? Yeah, somebody said that's a lot of baloney. I don't know if I believe it or not. And, and so Ripley's Believe It uh, or Not, it's a book filled with a lot of things that I think I would have to see to believe. But you know, if they are true, they're true, whether I believe it or not. You see, truth doesn't depend on me. Thomas, in the upper room with the disciples, said, I have to see it to believe it reminds us that skepticism is a human trait. Uh, uh, unfortunately, at that moment, Thomas didn't believe or remember the promises of Jesus that he made about the death and resurrection. And then in, in the story, it says Thomas was back with them again a week later. I always wondered, why did Jesus make Thomas wait? I can only imagine what's going on with the disciples. Here's what I think was going on. Jesus appears to the disciples. He goes away. Thomas shows up, and he says, I'm not going to believe that on your word here. So, so in the first day of the week, then we see that even a close relationship of people that have been together for three years, it didn't bring them together. How many times in the upper room did Jesus talk about his need for his disciples to love one another? Paul wrote, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. Disbelief can break up relationships. 
Day two, day three, the discussion continues. Day four and day five, the, the this division gets, gets a little heated between Thomas and the rest. By day six, they're probably close to going their separate ways. The disciples were probably thinking about what a church would be like for the risen Christ. Well, Thomas is probably thinking about creating a church that would honor Jesus. I found that things what it can divide people, but Jesus divides a lot of people. How many Christian denominations are there? Just look around. How many are founded on false pretenses and ideologies that, that go against the gospel? I have a Unitarian friend, and I call him friend. We, we discuss things. He says, you just can't believe all that miracle stuff in the Bible. I say, I believe it. But here with Thomas, why did Jesus let this go on for so long? Why did Jesus leave Thomas in his doubts for so long? And I, I sometimes question that myself. Why does Jesus let me go on with my doubts and questions, my misunderstandings? I don't understand why this coronavirus is here. Why does God allow this to, to go on? What is, is happening? And then a week later, Jesus shows up. Fortunately, they're still together. And he has a greeting. And he says, peace be with you. And, and in, in English, we don't see the full impact of this. He, he's using the word you in plural. His greeting is peace be with you, my disciples, all of you. In the midst of their struggles, God wants them to be at peace. He first dealt with the disciples, he wanted peace among them. Peace be with you. And here they were with the first test of peace, and they blew it here. Then Jesus, who he knew what Thomas asked before, uh, he, he, Thomas didn't have to say anything. Jesus just showed his ID. He pulled out his, his hands, his side. He said, put your hands here. This is my ID, the scars in my hand, the scar on my side that validated him as the savior of the world. I, I always wonder why in the resurrected body did Jesus still bear the scars, but they were to be a reminder of what God did for us. And Jesus says to Thomas, stop doubting and believe. When life gets you down, when difficulties come, when an impossible thing happens, Jesus has stopped doubting and believe. And Thomas responds with a confession of faith. He simply says, my Lord and my God. They're two distinct things back in the day. Lord, he says, my Lord, which uh, Lord is, is the one who's in charge. He's the one who makes the rules for your life. He's an, Lord is a word that's used for an earthly ruler. The, the Romans called Caesar Lord. It was on their coins. It said, Caesar is Lord. But the Christians said, Jesus is Lord. And it was more than words. It was, it was a life. It was a belief is the way they lived. Because by saying Jesus is Lord, back in the day, it could get you killed. So Thomas said that Jesus was his Lord, his earthly ruler, but then he says, and my God. He was his divine ruler. He was the authority of, of heaven and earth. And there's an interesting word there. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. It's the, it's, it's the descriptor, it's my, the emphasis on the my. The confession is personal. It's, it's ownership. He's not just saying Jesus is the Lord, Jesus is God, but he's saying he's my Lord. He's my God. Jesus, you are my earthly ruler and my heavenly ruler. One of the stipulations of our Christian faith is that we believe in the risen Christ. And Jesus gives a punchline at the end of the story. He says, blessed are those who believe even though they haven't seen. And that's where we are. Have you ever heard someone say, I'd believe if Jesus or God would just appear to me? If God would just send me a note and I'd know it was him? 
many people today, I believe, wouldn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead because they haven't seen him with their, their own eyes. They want proof of identity before they believe. And I understand that skepticism. And Jesus said, blessed are those who believe without seeing. We're called in our walk with God. We are called to accept Jesus by faith. Maybe others have to see Jesus alive and well and living, but they can see Jesus alive and well and living in the lives of those who follow him, those who are at peace, those who show love, those who care, those who live out the risen Christ in their life. We can see Jesus. Many of you perhaps read the, the book written in 2007 called The Shack. The book speaks about a skepticism about our need to see or to experience God before we'll, we'll believe. The, the author, William Young, he calls the book a metaphor for a human heart that's been scarred by abuse and pain. He says the shack is the house where we hide our wounds the way the character Mac in the novel tries to hide the great sadness in his life. The author calls the book a fictional narrative of his own spiritual journey. And when he opened the door of his shack, he discovered the all-embracing love of the triune God who had been there all the time. The great sadness kept him from believing. It made him skeptical, cynical, and even bitter and a bit angry. There's a lot that we could call the great sadness today in our own lives. The struggles that we have dealing with coronavirus, the, the uncertainty of when this is going to turn around, when life will get back to, to normal. Will there be a, a normal as we used to know it? Maybe a little, we can be a little like Thomas after a week of being with his friends who had seen the risen Christ and yet still had that gnawing doubt in the middle of his, of his soul. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. My question today is, do you have doubts? I bet you do. Life's circumstances can sometimes cause us to question our faith. And in the midst of this coronavirus, God wants us to have faith, to trust God, to serve God, to honor God, to be at peace with each other and to be at peace with God. Skepticism tells us it's not worth it. I don't believe it will help. I can't do this. But Jesus asks us to do something difficult. To move from skepticism to belief. To believe. And he says, then we will be blessed. For blessed are those who believe without seeing. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for this day, for your love and care for us. It's easy, God, to be skeptical in the midst of all the struggles and difficulties, the, the questions we ask, the why, God, why does this happen? Why? I wish you would just show up and tell me why, but you'd show me. But yet, we believe. We have faith. We put our trust in you. That in the midst of everything that may seem like it's crumbling around us, or it may be a difficulty, we are called to put our faith and trust in you. That you love us like a, a heavenly parent, a heavenly mother, a heavenly father that doesn't give up, that's there with us no matter what. And I thank you that you will always be my heavenly parent. Whether or not I honor you or not. Whether or not I doubt or whether I trust. I know, God, you want us to, to trust, to be at peace. And I ask that you would help us to do that. Because we can only get through these times through our faith in you. Bless each one of us. I lift and pray to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
before we, we leave, I just want to see if anybody has any thoughts, any uh, final reflections, something that's stirred in your heart during our service today that you would like to unmute and share with us. Well, my prayer is that God will give us the strength and the courage to trust God in the midst of everything that we say, I don't understand why this is going on or why this happens. But let's, uh, in the midst of that, we need to proclaim as Thomas did. Thomas saw and touched. We have faith without seeing that Jesus is our Lord and our God. And so let's uh, mutedly sing, crown him with many crowns. <laughs>